Go ahead, Steve. Okay. Well, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, so it's it's my pleasure to uh, over the next uh, hour to be you know spending some time together with a couple of colleagues. Uh, I'm uh, Steve Hodgins. I'm uh, the editor in chief of Global Health Science and Practice, and I'm based at the University of Alberta. Um, I have a, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Dr. Shea Bimbala, and he's uh, editor in chief of uh, BMJ Global Health, and uh, a colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Rajni Vade, who's um, uh, who works with me as a, an associate editor on global health science and practice. So uh, without further ado, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. Rimbla. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I, I, will, I will try and give about 10 minutes of, of remarks. Um, this session is um, based on an editorial that I wrote, um, which marked the fifth anniversary of BMJ Global Health. It's a very young journal, um, just as global health science and practice is a very young journal. And what I, I was thinking about as I wrote that editorial um, was what I would have written if I knew exactly what um, global health journals really felt like from the inside when I started in the role five years ago. And I say this partly because of, of where I come to global health. I, I'm a Nigerian. I was born and raised in Nigeria. I worked in public health in Nigeria for several years before I moved overseas. And one of the things that struck me, um, and I've been involved in, in journals long before I moved overseas, so I was, I was quite act actively involved in, in journal editing um, with the BMJ, um, even when I was a medical student, so very, very long time ago. And what, what struck me as, as a practitioner in Nigeria, medical practitioner, public health practitioner, was the um, limited extent to which what journals published played a role in what we did on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, um, in, in my role as a, as a global health journal editor, I, one of the things that kept striking me um, again and again um, was how very many of the things that were submitted and got published in the journal that I edit and in, other, in, in similar other journals uh, were things that for the most part were peripheral at best to what um, I used to, to, to the kinds of knowledge that I needed and, and used when I was involved in public health uh, on the ground in Nigeria. And, and I've been asking myself for several years now, how can we as global health journals be more useful? Now we play an important role and an and often useful role. Um, and I don't want to sound as though I think we are useless, but I think that the ways in which we are useful seem to me of, of a different order to, to the ways in which we could be primarily useful, which was one of the reasons why I tried to find a, a framework and a language in the editorial to describe exactly how I, how, how I understood the issue, right? And I'll try and explain what I mean by that very quickly. Um, and it's the sense in which the kind of knowledge that people, for example, in a district, in a, in a state government's health department, or in a USAID program in Nigeria, the kind of knowledge that they used um, on the ground as they are trying to solve problems on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and the kind of knowledge that they generate um, which are often very contextual localized practical sense-making kind of on-the-go knowledge um, is, is to, to my mind a very huge chunk of the knowledge that global health produces um, and, and I, I, I think of the, that kind of knowledge as a kind of plumbing kind of knowledge which is the kind of knowledge that you generate every day to incrementally progressively improve a system towards equity, which I understand to be to be the goal of, of public health, at least an important goal of public health and of global health. And there's another kind of knowledge which I, I got to understand really quite closely in my research in Nigeria. Um, I, I studied and I continue to study community health committees um, in, in local communities in Nigeria. And, and again, working with them brought very closely home to me how, again, the kind of knowledge that those committees used to drive the equity agenda within their com communities and in advocacy to government and in campaigns to government and in lobbying for support of different kinds. And I thought of that kind of knowledge um, as emancipatory, sort of, again, emancipatory use of knowledge, which would include civil society and, and activists and, and a broad range of people. And so plumbing and the emancipatory uses of knowledge for me were in, in many ways primary and in many ways huge. 
Um, and if, if there's a kind of knowledge that I, I don't see often enough in, in global health journals, it's those two kinds of knowledge. Um, and again, I'm not sure what it looks like, what it would look like. And it's one of the questions that I would pose at the end of, of my talk. What would it look like if we were to take those kinds of knowledge seriously? What will global health journals look like? What will our remit be? What will the structures and the processes that we employ look like? Um, now, there are two other kinds of uses of knowledge, um, which I, I find um, very, very highly represented in, in global health journals. And they should be represented. I just don't think that they should be as represented as they currently are relative to other things. So one of them is what I call engineering use of knowledge, which is the kind of knowledge that one produces for uh, and in the process of, of making policies. Uh, in many ways, as, as researchers in global health, we, we, we like to think that we are serving the purposes of policymakers, which is true, but only true to an extent. In many ways, we should be serving the purposes of emancipators and, and of plumbers who really are on the cold face and on the forefront of trying to improve systems um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so that engineering use of knowledge is the kind of use of knowledge that comes about um, through um, designing policies, designing systems um, at a high level. And the fourth kind of use of knowledge is, is the um, what I call the professors, the professorial use of knowledge, which in many ways it's uh, is the kind of thing that, that academics publish um, uh, and, and focus a lot of attention on, which in many ways um, often point at uh, a, a kind of generalizability, a kind of universality, um, the, a way in which we academics produce knowledge with the assumption that it was going to apply everywhere or should be able to apply everywhere, that there's this sort of overarching blanket, huge, um, uh, uh, knowledge production uh, and, and use. And what I found potentially problematic in that, and it, it's something that, that cuts across um, a lot of, of public health and global health journals, is that we, we, we are often too eager, eager for what is global and universal, um, that we ignore what is local. Again, um, what does it mean to take what is local seriously on the pages of, of academic journals? Um, yeah, so, so that, that's quickly a, a brief summary of, of the editorial on which this discussion is based. Uh, but, but I want to, to, to pose four sets of problems or questions um, that I hope we can discuss and, and I hope the, the audience will pick up on um, robustly as, as we go ahead. The first is, of course, the, the point that I've, I've tried to make so far, which is that the way I see it, the way I see them, global health journals are currently not particularly fit for purpose. Um, in, in, in the preferences that they make, in the kinds of knowledge that they choose to, to, to champion and publish and advance. Um, and, um, and that ultimately the, the role of professors or the role of academic, of, of global health journals should be to help to connect systems more with themselves. And when you think about that kind of goal of connecting systems more with themselves, global health journals seem to connect a, a global, very vaguely defined kind of system to more of itself at very high level uh, and who then connects lower systems or smaller systems, smaller spaces um, to more of themselves um, within and, and across. So for point number one. Point number two um, is, is how, how might these knowledge platforms uh, then be reformed? Uh, how can global health journals better serve uh, plumbers and emancipators? And I'm very keenly aware that, that the audience of this session is, is mostly plumbers, uh, people who, who work in programs. And, and so I'm really keen to hear from, from the audience what they think and how they think global health journals could serve them better. The third point that I want to make is um, uh, one of the feedback that I've received from those who have read the, the editorial has been, but what about the role of funders? You know, a lot of what we do um, is, is constrained or is within the constraints that, that funders define that, that for anything to change, funders have to change. But my, my response has been, and I, I will begin to hear what this audience um, has to say to this, because I know this audience also works with funders a lot. Um, my, my response has been that for funders to change, we um, who want them to change have to ask them to change um, without asking them to change insistently, persistently, compellingly, and forcefully, they won't change. But again, I'm, I'm keen to hear what, what the audience thinks about that. 
And, and the fourth point that I want to, 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 I hope we can talk about a bit, is what will it take for professors to change? Because I, I, the way that I see the role, the primary role that professors could play in, in the global health knowledge ecosystem, it's for them to be those who help to connect systems with more of themselves. But I also understand that, that a lot of the, the academic pipeline system, the educational system, the process that determine and, that, and, and frame what academics do um, is such that it does not lead them in, in, in those directions. So, so uh, and an idea that I've had in my mind for a while is how can we restructure the education system and the pipeline that produces academics in a way that actually puts these issues right in front of their mind, rather than something they have to then think about once they start to work. Um, so that's the fourth point, and I'm going to stop there because I know we don't have a lot of time. Thank you very much, and I hope looking forward to a, a great discussion with everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot, Shay. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, another colleague, uh, Natalie, who's going to uh, queue up um, uh, a video from uh, Dr. Rajni Vaid. So she's she's um, kind of joining us, I would say, asynchronously. <laughs> to try and bring a practice viewpoint to the users of knowledge based a little bit on the article that is the central focus of this panel discussion. So the challenges in current knowledge use can be can, relates to three major stakeholder groups. The first and the most important is that of people. And we all agree that people's knowledge really contributes, should contribute to making decisions that affect their day-to-day -day lives. But in reality, large-scale implementation offers very little opportunity to mainstream people's knowledge into decision-making. The second major source of knowledge is that garnered by academicians, research, and researchers and technical domain experts. Now here, one of the aspects of this and a major limiting factor is that academic and field practitioner relationships is governed by power hierarchies and knowledge access. How often have those of us who published literature on sub-district and district level implementation programs gone back or tried in some way to inform even the field area from which this was gathered on what the findings of the studies were and how they might affect the way they uh, implement programs. The second related to this category of stakeholders is that research agendas relate to the needs of the funding agency and the topic that is currently an important one from their point of view. The third is that the products that are developed by academicians and researchers are not often designed for practice. The third and the third major stakeholder group really is the policymaker group. Now policymakers derive their knowledge from multiple sources and of all three stakeholders, they are the ones who are perhaps with the most power to convert people's knowledge into uh, policy making. They derive it from research studies, from policy briefs, from their own political experiences, and of course, one must say from political compulsions. But even here, there's very little space for integrating tacit knowledge of district and sub district teams into policy making for programs. I'm going to share with you what we did with an, a product, a knowledge product called the ASHA Update. This was a semi-annual publication. It was an in-house publication, started in October 2009. And I believe the last issue uh, is dated July 2020. Really the intent of the ASHA update um, and was to share just a few uh, points of the ASHA program. It uh, started in 2005. We have about 1 million ASHAs now in rural and urban areas. The coverage of the ASHA is one per thousand in rural areas and one per 2,500 in urban areas. The training and support systems of the ASHA program span sub-district, district, state, and national levels. Now, the purpose of the ASHA update was to share information on program progress, 
allowed for specific technical inputs and also for state-wise comparisons, allowing us at the national level to look at some strategies that could be categorized for groups of states based on not just the performance of the ASHA program, but also on their performance on a range of health systems parameters. The second major purpose of the ASHA update was to highlight local innovations and best practices and share at the national level and among the state stakeholders. We were quite conscious that there was no way this publication would ever go down below the state level, partly because of the language in which it was written, it was written in English. Uh, identify, the third important objective was to identify, and perhaps the most important was identifying successes and challenges to inform policy related to the ASHA program. Um, and I'm really glad to say that partly, not all of course, partly as a result of the ASHA update, we were able to advocate for additional remuneration for the ASHA to enable more investment in skill-based training, to build the capability of supervisors and highlighting the potential of the ASHA to be involved in primary health care and thus institutionalizing the program really in India's public health system. And finally, I'm going by, to end by saying, how can we do better in knowledge use? And I think this, there's a single governing principle, with, which is that knowledge needs to go back to its co-producers in ways that benefit them. Um, second, we need to change the way we use knowledge, even for those of us at the implementation levels or the research and the academic levels and go beyond peer reviewed journals. I know there is a lot of discussion and debate on this. We talk about peer reviewed journals, converting evidence to policy resulting in policy briefs, but I still say, then what? How does this policy brief translate into knowledge use for the people out there closest in the community and closest to the community? The third objective, I think that we all need to work on is how, do, how does knowledge inform the field? Uh, how do we get better in terms of theories, frameworks, and concepts, both refining existing ones and coming up with new ones? And this really needs partnerships between researchers and practitioners. And this is one place where we will really have to do much, much better than we do today. And one way of doing that is to invest in knowledge transfer platforms and strengthen knowledge intermediaries and, knowledge, and relationships and connections between uh, public health universities, global academic institutions, at, between national and subnational institutions, and perhaps creating a platform pra for practitioners to come together so that they may feed into each other and therefore strengthen the use of knowledge for people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Rajni. So we're getting a lot, a lot out on the table. These are these are big issues. Um, I I think it's I think I'm making a fair assumption that uh, pretty well pretty well everybody who's um, uh, who's on this uh, session today. I mean, we care about kind of what's happening out there on the ground. We care about effective programs and services. I think we I think we share a commitment as public health practitioners to contributing to to greater equity and to improved population health outcomes. Um, at the same time, where each of us sit, we're not necessarily optimally kind of interacting uh, in, in a way to accomplish what we want to see happen. Um, the, uh, I mean, as, as uh, uh, Shay was uh, saying, I mean, one of the things that's, that's, that, that we appreciate today engaging with you is that most of you are uh, very much engaged on the ground. I think for people who are kind of doing that work on the ground, whether it's as uh, as plumbers or or implementers, or whether as, as as advocates or or emancipators, there's a lot that we kind of learn by doing. Uh, and you know, anybody who's kind of engaged and committed working on the ground, uh, there's lots of things that you know that you learn as you go, and then you you know you adapt your strategy. Uh, I think what what journals can do, and, and certainly uh, journals are not the only mechanism, but what journals can do is, is in, 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 as um, uh, Shay was saying, help the system connect to more of itself. So rather than each of us working in isolation and kind of reinventing the, the wheel, there's an opportunity, if we do a really good job at kind of connecting up this broader system where we can learn vicariously, so we can learn from each, each other's experiences. Now, um, 
one of the directions of that, and, and this is something that uh, Rajni was uh, referring to, is for good sound policy decisions that are actually supportive of what's happening on the ground, there's a need to learn from what's happening on the ground. So, so one of the, one of the um, dimensions or directions where we need to forge these stronger links is between kind of what's happening at the ground level and then what's happening at the level of, of people who are making kind of high level policy decisions. Uh, at the same time, um, for people who are engaged in, in actual on the ground practice, you know, that you have lots and lots of counterparts who are working in other places, maybe in the same country, in the same region, or maybe in other regions. And obviously in each of the different settings that we work in, we're dealing with somewhat different circumstances, different opportunities and challenges, but potentially uh, arising out of the work that we're doing, there may very well be lessons, kind of non-obvious but important lessons arising from our work that could be of relevance elsewhere. Now this is maybe somewhat analogous to this kind of scientific idea of generalizability. Um, but I, again, I think that the kind of the, the, the archetypal kind of scientific way of understanding things, and this is something that Shay was mentioning before, is that we're driving towards some kind of generalizable context-free knowledge. Now, you know, if you're doing basic fundamental physics or, I mean, there are other areas of science where that may be a perfectly appropriate paradigm, but we're engaged in public health practice and it's complicated and messy. And it's, you know, we're, 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 you know, we're kind of dealing with human systems and, and uh, kind of human uh, agency. And that kind of, I, I think the idea of perfectly universal or generalizable knowledge is less appropriate when we're thinking about you know, trying to get more effective uh, public health work on the ground. So I, I think there's something somewhat analogous to generalizability uh, in, in, in our area. Like, so there can be important things that you're learning in your program setting that help you to redirect your efforts and, and work more effectively and make better progress towards equity. At the same time, there may be things that you're learning that others could really benefit from. And I mean, so one of the mechanisms or the ways that we try to make things like that happen is through conferences. And I mean, now, I mean, one of the blessings in disguise of the COVID epidemic is we're having conferences like this on uh, um, uh, kind of on a, on a remote basis, but this allows um, uh, participation much more, more broadly than in-person conferences. Some of you have participated in previous years in the, in the, in the GH Tech uh, conferences, mini university conferences that were held in Washington, DC. For the most part, the people who were able to participate and benefit were people who, just who are based in the DC Baltimore area. But now we're able to, uh, you know, to have people connected from, from, uh, from all over the world. Uh, and again, I think um, global health journals can and should be playing that same role, where we're not just uh, um, facilitating dissemination of universal generalizable uh, knowledge, but where we're supporting kind of capture of important lessons that are arising from doing the work at the coal face that other practitioners can benefit from. So I, again, I, I, I think I, I mean, Shay and I are certainly not the only uh, journal edit editors who, <laughs> who are um, uh, kind of really keen to be doing better in this area. Now, what I'm hoping over the you know the remainder of the time our, our time together is is that we're going to have really active discussion, and we'd really like to hear from you about how we can do our job better, how we can help facilitate uh, kind of connecting the system to more of itself. Okay, so we're going to open it up now um, for for um, discussion and questions. Let's see here. Okay, so um, you can post your questions on the uh, chat room uh, and then um, we've got somebody uh, kind of helping us manage, manage this as it comes in. One of the questions that here is uh, how to ensure that decision makers can use knowledge coming from publication as most of them in low and middle income countries don't, uh, don't, don't have access to scientific journals. Do you wanna take a crack at that, uh, Shay? Um, yes, and and in fact, that, that's that's part of the the motivation behind um, a lot of these these reflections that that, mm -hmm. that I know for sure that that policymakers in in LMICs hardly read journals if they ever do, and even if they did, which is a second level of issue, even if they did, they likely wouldn't find very many things in it that are very useful for for the idea to their work. So it's a, it's a two pronged problem. 
right? One is how do we think of a platform that, that is much more flexible than journals and, and, and the web page to reach um, these this different audiences? Um, and second, how do we make sure that what is in um, in the in the journal itself or, or on that platform actually speaks to to, to their needs um, in a very relevant way. Now, I, I think there's some promise in in, in technology. Again, I, I'm not a tech expert, but I know, but I suspect that that the future is a much more technological one. And and if there's this promise of connectivity and connection that technology um, offers, then I think it's time now for journals in global health to start thinking about how, how we may exploit that. Again, I, I have no concrete ideas on how to do that, but I suspect, I feel as though there's, there's something uh, on the cusp uh, that we need to start trying to, to grasp. Yeah. I mean, certainly, I mean, now it, it used to be that if you wanted to read a medical journal, you had to go to a library somewhere, you had to have a subscription and then every month that, you know, you you'd get a paper copy. So nowadays, I mean, all pretty all journals now are, are online. Now, some of them, there's, you know, much of the material is behind a paywall. <laughs> So that's a problem, but but more and more, like there are efforts to make make material available, uh, you know, with, without there being a paywall barrier. You know, some journals are, are set up in such a way that if you're if you're um, connecting in from a low and middle income country, then you know you don't face the same paywall that you do if you're in a high income country. So there's, in principle, like there, like access is is technologically possible. I mean, the problem is that the way we like the, the format of our, our of our journal articles isn't very user friendly unless you're an academic. <laughs> so I mean, so so the, the articles may be technologically um, uh, accessible, but they're not practically speaking very accessible. Now, there, there one journal actually that <laughs> that actually does sit behind a paywall. So in that respect, isn't so good. Is, is the Harvard Business Review. But one of the things I, I I do appreciate about about that journal is that um for all of their main articles they have the article in like three or four different forms uh in the journal so they've got the full length version and then they've got the somewhat shorter version kind of the reader's digest version and then they've got the kind of the one pager and then they've got the uh you know the 50 word version <laughs> so uh so they recognize that for their target readership which is not just academics at business schools but it's business executives it's people who are who, who are busy people out in the world that they don't have time to kind of read through you know uh, like every issue cover to cover so what they try to do is to it, it is at varying levels of compression they try to get across the key points and i know like many global health journals now like in addition to conventional abstracts like we're trying to find other ways of kind of getting the key points and then kind of what's what's most relevant in the papers up front and so just over this last year, Global Health Science and Practices has made a, a bit of incremental movement in that direction. But again, I mean, we're, we, we very much welcome input from readers on kind of how to do a better job of that. Because again, we recognize that a lot of the people who are high priority kind of target audience for us, they're, they're busy people and they, you know, they don't have the luxury of spending hours and hours every week reading uh, academic articles. Okay. So we have some more questions here. Um, so one is, um, so what do you think, what do you all think about two functions of journals? So the first function as a well, as well-known nodes for networking and getting the word out about new and new and emerging best practices. And then the second one is as arbiters of what is actually quote unquote working well, applying some sort of dispassionate judgment and agreed upon criteria. So otherwise, it's just one person's word against another as as to what's working. So wouldn't this be an argument, not for getting rid of journals, but for making more voices heard within academic global health? So again, I'll let you take a first crack at that. <laughs> yes, and and this this connects with what you were saying earlier, um, Stephen. Um, there is, um, if if all we publish, if all we aim to publish are research papers from studies that were conducted sort of over two or three years in a district, discrete period it, it, with a particular hyper-focused question, um, we, we do a lot of disservice. Um, and so, something that, that, that um, I've been very keen to promote, um, with, not with as much success as I wish in, in BMJ Global Health, is a format of paper that we call practice papers. And I know Global Science and Practice does something very similar. 
which is to get people who, who do stuff um, and who have the time or space or resources to write about them, to actually write about their experience and what they learn. Um, I, and I've been, I've been thinking a lot, again, speaking to this particular question, that I hope that at some, at some time in, in the not so distant future, people can sit down and start to synthesize those practice papers in, in a way that is not too dissimilar from what, how we do systematic reviews today. In other words, there are people who have tried to solve a problem, say, in, in how you implement a, 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 a malnutrition program at the district level. And, and there have been practice papers from 50 countries, right? Different countries, different settings. Someone could sit down and, and put them all together and try to see what are the common threads and what are, what are the, uh, the lessons that you could synthesize out of them. And I, I don't think we can get to that point without having all these voices in, in these spaces. In other words, we, we need more and more people writing from a place of experience. It will be contextual, it will, it will be particular, it will be very specific. But when you bring a person's experience next to another person's experience, you start to see what, what the, the truth is that, that, that is applicable to another place. And I think for me, that's perhaps a path to get in there. Yeah. Yeah, one of the ways that I'm kind of helped in thinking about this, this comes from uh, Ray Pawson, who some of you uh, are familiar with, and he's, he's written about uh, kind of, about realist based evidence synthesis. <laughs> And so you can have a range of programs that are have the same label, and they may have you know you know very similar objectives, and there may be similarities in how they're implemented. But at the same time, there can be a lot of variability across settings in the way these programs function and in, and in how well they perform. So, but he talks about how how you can take these multiple instantiations of programs, otherwise somewhat similar programs. And then kind of look at, at, at characteristic of the, of the context and then the actual mechanism that seems to be at work and then the outcomes that they're getting. And so looking across these multiple cases, you're, you're kind of making comparisons and out of that you can draw higher level conclusions. He talks about generating mid-level theory. So it's, it's again somewhat analogous to our meta-analytic quantitative systematic reviews, but this is trying to capture uh, kind of lessons and, and, and knowledge arising out of programs to draw some higher level conclusions that can help inform practice. So again, I mean, uh, uh, at our journal, we would certainly welcome kind of well done uh, realist synthesis <laughs> if you want to submit it to us. And I, um, I'm a huge fan of, of Ray Forsen and, um, and I use that in my work a lot. So I, I, I do a lot of this kind of synthesis of lessons uh, on, on programs across a range of places. And, and it's, really, it's really very useful. Um, when, when you look at the final product, it, it feels like wisdom. You see what I mean? It feels like <laughs> yeah. it contains a lot of knowledge here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wisdom can be richer and more valuable than mere evidence sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, some more questions here. Um, so a question here is, uh, most policymakers and implementers have lots of knowledge and ground level experience to share to the, with the global community, but most lack the time and the capacity to meet the requirements of journals. So what are we doing differently to attract support and encourage policymakers and implementers to publish papers? And, I'll, and again, I'll let Shay take a first crack at that. Um, one of the things that, that breaks my heart um, uh, it's when I hear a policymaker or an activist, and I've had both groups of people say this to me, that they did not think of writing what, they, what their knowledge is because they did not think that journals would publish it. Um, which for me just tells me that I am part of a system that has set up its own incentive structures in a way that precludes some of the most important kind of knowledge mm -hmm. getting heard. So, so I think one of, the, one of the ways to think about solving that problem is for journals to signal um, a welcoming attitude um, to, to all that kind of knowledge um, in the first place. I, I think a lot of people don't even think about writing it because it, it's just not done. And we need to get to a place where it is done. Um, but the second, I think the second thing to think about here beyond what journals can do is what academics um, see as valuable uh, and, and prestigious. I can imagine uh, a scenario in which an academic spends six months with that kind of, of, of policymaker and they, and they write a piece together in, in that six months, shadowing 
him or her, uh, learning from him or her, and observing what they do, and, and sort of just bringing out the, the, the knowledge and wisdom yeah. from their work. Yeah. Now, that, that kind of work is not the kind of work that, you know, gets you a Nobel Prize, not that we have Nobel Prize in, in, in global health, but gets you a last publication, mm -hmm. for example. And again, it's, 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 an, it's an incentives problem in, in, many, in many ways, that we, we need uh, an incentive structure that, that encourages an academic to feel that part of their primary job is connecting a system or systems to more of themselves, um, rather than just generating this hyper, hyper uh, tuned uh, bites of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, b both of those points are really important. I mean, I'll just kind of emphasize both of them again, kind of in my own words. I mean, the first is, is it has to be more evident to people out there that our journals really do welcome this kind of material. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it helps like once articles like this start to appear in our in our journals, you know, then just by precedent, people get the idea that yes, that is publishable. And you know, these journals may be interested in that. One of the things we, we have a, at our journal, as with other journals, we have a, a, a an, edit, an editorial board. And the way our, we use our board is, the way we have been using them, them re, more recently, is we consult with them from time to time and get their advice. And one of the messages that we've got from them over this past year is that for us to do a better job at, at, at um, addressing our mandate, we have to be more proactive. So we need, we need to be actively reaching out to people and, 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 and inviting. And now this may be through special calls, like calls for special kind of categories of papers, but it can also mean reaching out to individuals. And that gets me to the second point that Shay was making too, is that busy policymakers and implementers, um, in some instances, I mean, these are very sharp people, they're very capable people, but they're, you know, they may not write, it's, you know, they, it may not be part of their job, it may be, you know, for them to be writing kind of extended articles. Um, even if they are quite able to write, like in many instances, they're, they're too busy. And I've got, I've got colleagues of mine that I'm working with, you know, kind of partnering on, on various papers, and, and, you know, they're moving ahead quite slowly, because for my, for my colleagues, like in, they're not incentivized to spend uh, their work days uh, uh, producing papers. And so to the extent that they're involved in this at all, it's something that they have to do in evenings and weekends. But I, I, I think, and this is a, a, a really good suggestion from Shay, as, as we have people whose day jobs uh, are as academics or are, and do involve writing, I, I, I think it, it would be a very good thing for us to see a lot more partnering, like of people who've, you know, they've got the competencies and they've, you know, you know, it, is, you know it is something that's kind of expected of them in their day jobs, but for to, have, but to have them partnering with policymakers and, and, uh, you know, program implementers to, to write pieces together. I mean, I see that as a, as, as a very good solution. So, um, so we have uh, time for a, a few more questions. We're going to spend a, a few minutes at the end just to, if, you know, Shay and I will we'll talk a bit about what our respective journals are are trying to do in this space. But we have a few. We have time for a few more questions here. Uh, so one here is the the paywall barrier limits access to consumption of knowledge, but the movement to open source often erects barriers to contribute to knowledge, like in the form of submission fees. So what are options to reduce? both barriers, paywall uh, and article processing fees, barriers to knowledge consumption uh, and contribution. So your thoughts, Shay? Yeah, I, I'll go first, yeah. And I, I'll go by mentioning global science and practice, which uh, has no submission fees. Uh, and I, I, I do believe very strongly that the, that the future of opening up this space is in creating journals like global science and practice creating many more of them. Um, and, and I know that there are barriers to creating journals, but, but again, if, if we recognize that that is the way forward, I'm sure that, that, that those barriers can be surmounted. I, I don't think, for example, I edit a journal uh, that has a, a, a submission fee. And if you understand capitalism really well, you know that people don't let go of money unless they must. Um, so I, I believe very strongly that the, the way forward is having alternatives um, that focus on practice, like global science and practice does, um, that, that is funded uh, in a way that does not require people to pay much, if anything at all, for, for submission fees. And I hear a lot of, of practitioners and academics complain about, um, about the submission fees. And what, what often comes to my mind is that if as many of us are, are complaining about this, at some point we need to come together and create alternatives. And, and I 
regardless of my position as an initiative of a journal with submission fees, will be very keen to support such an initiative because I don't think the BMJ Publishing Company will will let go of, of the money they make um, simply because some people um, that I'm not very sure they think the center in, in their thinking need to access and, and, and use this platform. So I, I think the, the solution, frankly, to that is more, 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 more journals like Global Science and Practice funded and supported in a way that does not require profit making or require people paying so much submission fees. Yeah, I mean, we're, we do have a luxury to be able to operate in this way because of how we're funded. I mean, one of the things certainly like for any journal, like there are real costs in, 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 in running journals. And I mean, one way or the other, like those costs need to, need to be covered. Now, in, in, in our case, like we benefit because like our funding is, 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 is all from, from the US government. I mean, there are other journals that similarly have um, no uh, publication fee and then their free access. Uh, I mean, WHO Bulletin is another example. But again, I mean, they have institutional funding that they're able to make available to, to, to support the journal without having to charge either the, either authors or readers. But I, 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 I certainly agree, agree with Shay, like we need to, I guess, persuade those who, who control resources that this kind of access, both for authors and for readers, this is a public good. And like, as long as we're imposing restrictions on either end, then that's that's an impediment to, to, to free exchange of knowledge. I mean, it, and what it does is it's uh, it's disconnecting the parts of a system from each other. And that's, uh, that's not helpful. Okay. Um, so we have another question here. Um, let's see here now. Okay, says, uh, says we looked at BMJ and Global Health Science and Practice in publishing a paper like this using count data from BHIS2, but it didn't seem like a good fit. We ended up submitting to a, a journal of global health reports because it was a little more pragmatic and descriptive in focus rather than hy hypothesis testing uh, and ended up publishing it elsewhere. We'd be curious to hear more showcase examples of the types of articles you'd like to see uh, more of um you know being submitted in the future okay so that that, that question first so i i guess that's uh maybe i'll take a first crack at that because that seems to be more oriented to us um we i mean i could take a fair bit of time to talk about the kind of journey, kind of pieces that we want we first and foremost we we want the papers that we publish to be useful and relevant to people who are engaged in policy and program work so that's, I would say, the most fundamental bottom line. Now, at the same time, we want the papers to be rigorous, like in the sense that they're well supported. For us, rigorous doesn't mean a randomized controlled trial. Uh, but if, if, if they're original articles, again, I mean, you don't, you don't expect them to be kind of scientific in an academic sense, but they need to be, uh, um, you know, like, Causal claims need to be well supported. The you know the, you know the you know issues of you know, like appropriate um, uh, analysis methods need to be used. I mean, so we we as far as rigor is concerned, like we do apply somewhat similar standards to to other journals. But but for us, I guess most fundamentally important is is is, is usefulness. Now we do get some articles that are. Um, they, you know, they do a good job of documenting, uh, you know, you know, you know, lessons from a particular setting or context. Sometimes we make a judgment that, that, uh, like for us, that's of too much of local of, of local interest only, because because there can be again there can be uh, kind of worthwhile, useful documentation on 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 program lessons where it, it's going to be most highly relevant to people who are working in that same context. Uh, but it, but they may be less relevant beyond that uh, country context. So again, so sometimes there, you know, there are papers that we consider to be kind of good practical papers, and they're publishable. But maybe the the, the most uh, appropriate platform from them would be a national medical journal or a regional medical journal rather than one that's operating uh, at, at global level. Um, 
so anyway, so that is certainly one criterion is, 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 is the extent to which we, we, we feel that a paper is going to be of interest or relevance beyond just a single country. I'll stop there. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I'll just give a, a quick, um, I, I just opened our web page to, to uh, um, uh, March edition, just to look at the practice papers that we published um, in, in that month. Uh, and they have to do, one of them was about lessons learned from co-production of evidence and policy in Nigeria's COVID-19 response. So people who were working with the government to help design and, and, and produce evidence and, and, and policy directions in, in, the, in the response, describing what they learned in the process, and what, what worked, what didn't work. Um, another was uh, on employing learning health systems principles um, for, for child health in Kenya, which again, is, it's, it's a 10 year program and just documenting all, a lot of what they learned during those years, the, the finances, the politics, um, the day-to-day the, the -day realities of, of trying to develop, develop such a system. Um, uh, and in, in this month, one of the ones we published was on the field epidemiology learning and training program in Namibia, which again, Nam Namibian uh, people, policymakers and, and, and designers and implementers came together to, to write about what they've learned in, in the last, I think, five years of implementing that training program to strengthen um, their, their health system. And for me, I think one of the, the key, um, one of the things that drew me to, to a practice paper is seeing that local authors were heavily involved in writing them. So if I see a practice paper about country X and it's all full of you know, people working in the US, I, I'm less keen to, to, to take that on than say one in which half or 70% you know, of the authors are people who actually did the work. Uh, it gives me confidence that these people know what they're saying. It's, it's just a, a, short, a shorthand to, to, to being confident. So, so for me, it's very important that, that it's been led um, mostly um, and written mostly from, from, from where the experience itself is. Um, and yeah, I just stop there. Yeah, yeah, just, I mean, that's, that's essentially the same stance that we take. If there's a paper that's reporting on something happening in a particular country, and if, if, if all of the authors are from somewhere else, that's a problem for us. And as a general rule, like even if it's otherwise publishable, we don't proceed. So we, and, and we've made this more explicit in our instructions to authors now, is that, is that we expect there to be in, for, 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 for a paper that's reporting on experience in a particular country, we expect in country authorship. One other question, just very quickly, somebody was just asking whether global health science and practice prioritizes USAID funded work it does not <laughs> i mean the fact is that we were we were kind of funded from the very beginning uh, you know you know by usaid and i think we're better known in the usaid funded world so we get more submissions i think from usaid funded projects than from from other sources but if you if you're looking at say publication at, at, at what proportion of, of papers successfully get retained and published i don't think it would be any higher for submissions coming from um, uh, usaid funded work I mean, again, we're, we're, we're very interested in getting um, submissions regardless of the funding source. And we're, we're also very interested in getting, in getting submissions from, uh, I guess, from, from anywhere among kind of low and middle income countries. And so we, we, we tend to give special attention to papers that come in from uh, geographies that we don't otherwise see as much from. Um, so we just have, we have a, a, a less than 10 minutes left. And uh, so I, I did want to, uh, uh, you give a bit of time to Shay to, to comment a bit on, on kind of in, again putting on his his hat as as, as editor to, to to say what BMJ Global Health is is doing, uh, and I'll I'll take a couple minutes at the end to say a bit more about our, our journal. Yeah, th thank you, Steve. Um, so so I, I think for me the most important thing perhaps that we are doing um, is is trying to to promote the practice paper format. Um, and in many instances, we, we often ask people who have written up um, what would better be written up as a practice paper, as a research paper to, to convert it. And we, we give very detailed guidance on how to do that. Because there are papers that won't work as a research paper, but you see that there's a lot of insight there that, that would be relevant to practitioners that could then be rewritten and, and reformatted. And we try to encourage people to do that. Um, and another thing that, that, that I've been really trying very hard to do is to reach out to people I know should, should be writing for us um, who, who are not academics. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the only platform on which I, I, I do that is on Twitter because I, I'm, I'm quite present on Twitter and, and I, I know when people are talking and when people are thinking and I know when this person sh should write this thing that they've just tweeted about. 
Um, and it, it's one way of, of reaching out to, to people who otherwise wouldn't write or who wouldn't mm-hmm. think that what they have to, to offer is, is relevant. The other thing that, that um, for, for, for me um, is particularly important, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, the, is local authorship. Uh, and I, I, I think this is very important, partly also because I have a huge concern that a lot of knowledge in global health is, the knowledge system is very extractive, that, that you, um, a researcher goes into a place, um, takes knowledge and, and goes and publishes it in in BMG Global Health, that the people from whom they've taken the knowledge will, will hardly ever read. Um, th- th- that feels like theft <laughs> to me um, in many ways. Mm-hmm. And, and f- for that reason, I'm, I'm often very keen that I see um, signals of local use in the paper, whether it's, it's been written by those who will use the knowledge. In other words, um, um, we've generated evidence about how to improve clinical care um, for children in, in, in Kenya, and it was co-written by people who are actually involved in delivering clinical care or designing policies for clinical care. Then I, I know that for, to a very large extent, it, it's, the loop at least will be, will be completed, that, that this is going back to those who will, who will use it. Um, and, and for me, for me that, that's very important. Um, and I'm currently involved in an initiative to try and, and develop a, um, a, a submission guideline that, that compels authors to, 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 dis, to disclose um, one, how authorship decisions were made and, and how the knowledge that they've generated and they seek to publish has been used or will be used in concrete terms um, going forward. So, so that we also have a, uh, an incentive for authors to think about these issues long ahead of when, when they write, write their papers. Um, yeah, that, that's uh, for, for me the, the, the things that I think that we are, we are doing in this space, and and again, it's I believe very strongly in, in trying to think clearly about what the problem is um, before even thinking about solutions. And it, it's taken me quite some time to to work in my mind how to define the problem. And when I have a problem to define, I write, try to write about it because that forces me to think very clearly about what it is I'm trying to get at. But, but I, I hope we, we get more clarity as we go along because th- these are live and very important issues. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, I mean, we're, I think, struggling with, with, with a lot of the same issues and the same questions. I mean, among those who are, who are uh, kind of online with us today, I mean, we're, I think, very engaged with the practice community through the, the submissions that we get. I, I have to say, though, that quite a, a very large proportion of the submissions that we get are, they come out of work that's funded by external partners. So this is kind of donor funded technical assistance work in country. So yes, it's implementation. Yes, it's it's on the ground, but uh, a very large proportion, proportion of it is, is, is uh, externally funded. And that creates a certain power dynamic. And, and it, it can result in there being a kind of a usurpation or a misappropriation of a decision-making role. And and sometimes also credit. So, so what we may get, I mean, some instances is, like we'll get papers that come out of project work uh, where, you know, in a given country and out of a list of say 10 authors, there may be two or three of them that are in country. <laughs> now that's not so often the case now, but um, there's there's how the work itself is conducted. And then there's also kind of, uh, kind of who gets credit and who gets a voice as it gets documented. Um, and, and again, I think for all of us, this, you, know, you know, this is a work in progress. And I think all of us are kind of kind of trying to be kind of more clued into these dynamics, more sensitive. Um, and we're learning as we go. And so I, 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 I and, and certainly we're, 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 we're uh, we absolutely welcome your, your suggestions and inputs on, on how to do this better. So, and I, I think we're, we're just about at the and end just, of our hour. There was a question in, in the chat box that I think I, I could just spend one, 30 seconds. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, which, which is about, will you ever be open to diverse languages papers? Um, and I wanted to say that one of the things that we've done at BMJ Global Health is allow author groups to translate their papers and publish it as an online supplement to, yeah. to the main paper. And, and I know the journals are doing similar things. And I think it's, it's part of, again, the, the path forward. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I mean, we've had some similar inquiries. I mean, one of the things that we do we don't have the funds to, to cover the costs ourselves for translation, but when we get uh, papers that come from um, you know regions of the world where you know that are not anglophone regions, I mean we 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 um, we offer people the opportunity to themselves to 
uh, translate at least the abstract, and, and then we publish that in, in that language together with the with the paper. But I think the idea of uh, you know giving the option of having uh, uh, like a translate translated version kind of also available online. I mean that seems to me quite doable. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's just about brought us to the end of our time, uh, and we we thank you all for tuning in. There's I, I, we there may have been a couple of questions that we didn't get to, but we'll um, uh, we'll try in one way or the other to kind of respond to those afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, and mm -hmm. and thanks to Rajni who who couldn't join us live. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And then again, for any anybody, any of your colleagues, like people who are online who might benefit from this but weren't able to participate today, I mean, all of this is is going to be recorded. So, you know, get the link and you can forward that to your colleagues so others can uh, kind of benefit from the discussion we've been having today. Thank you. <laughs>